webinars are made possible thanks to generous donor support. If you'd like to contribute, please visit our website, autism.org. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Kaustub Supikar. I'm a clinical assistant professor um, in the Department of Psychiatry at Stanford University. And it's a great privilege uh, to be here. And I'm really honored and very excited uh, to present our work uh, related to um, sex differences in brain and behavior uh, in autism. So as you're all aware, um, autism spectrum disorder is a neurodevelopment condition characterized by social impairments in social interaction and communication, along with repetitive and restricted behaviors. This condition is highly heterogeneous, as some of you might be aware, as individuals diagnosed with this autism may present with varying intensities of difficulties across a wide range of domains pertaining to social, communication, behavioral, intellectual, as well as adaptive functioning. Dr. Stephen's um, sort of now famous quote, uh, where he quotes, where he said that, if you have met one individual with autism, you have met one individual with autism, truly reflects the high heterogeneity prevalent in the ASD community. Importantly, it is becoming increasingly apparent that the high heterogeneity is a major impediment to translating scientific discoveries to the clinic. And therefore, systematic disentangling of this high heterogeneity is crucial for developing more precise and effective diagnosis and targeted treatment strategies for ASD. Sex or gender is a key source of heterogeneity in autism. If you go back in time, even the first reports of autism in the 1940s by Hans Asperger's Describe no girls, actually, and four boys in his seminal paper. Subsequent um, paper by Leo Kanner also just described three girls and eight boys. Subsequently, one of the most consistent findings, if you look, of epidemiological research is that autism is diagnosed less frequently in females than in males with around a ratio of one to four. This consistently is nicely sort of illustrated for findings from a recent meta-analysis, which have been plotted here, of 54 epidemiological studies with almost 13 million participants, where there were 9,700 females and around 44,000 males, roughly uh, reflecting a ratio of one to four. And despite the increase in autism prevalence over the years, so when I started doing my research, I pretty regularly quote autism was prevalent in around 1 to 150, and now the latest estimates is 1 in 44, the male bias or the skewed gender ratio has sort of remained consistent over the years. Right? And sort of a fundamental question, which is sort of unaddressed, that researchers are confronted with this, why are there fewer females with ASD? And there are a number of possibilities that can explain this. Right? The first and foremost is, as you can see from the 1940s, the original paper, autism characteristics and phenotypes are largely derived from male individuals with this condition. With this male biased understanding of autism, there is likely an ascertainment bias in the clinical recognition of this condition, which may in part contribute to the apparent male bias in reported prevalence, despite the fact that the diagnostic conceptualization of ASD is meant to be sex independent. Furthermore, females may present with partly different behavioral characteristics that makes it more complicated for the autism phenotype to be recognized and the diagnosis to be made in a timely manner, which is often the case uh, with females. Another possibility is which has been come recently where it's hypothesized 
that females are sort of shielded from autism. This is sometimes referred to as a female protective effect model, which suggests that females require greater neurological load to manifest the same degree of impairments as males, leading to lower prevalence of ASD in females. So I think to better understand why there are fewer females with ASD, we need to first understand what are the behavioral and symptom presentations of autism in females and how do they differ from those in males. Additionally, we need to address what is the structural and functional organization of autistic brains in females and how do they differ from those in males. Apart from improving our understanding of lower prevalence of ASD in females, addressing these questions could result in sex-specific and general revisions to widely used ASD diagnostic instruments. For instance, if we observe that females with ASD consistently scored lower on a diagnostic instrument, maybe ADIR or ADOS or SRS or SCQ, we could introduce sex-specific scoring procedure for that instrument. Additionally, it could also inform the development of novel treatments. For example, you could develop new treatments that target male-specific brain-based risk factors. We could also develop new treatments which sort of mimic the female protective effect, and we could implement that and use that in males so that the prevalence in the males uh, would be reduced. Despite these critical implications, an urgent need, almost very, very little, is known about behavioral and brain signatures of autism in females. And the question sort of, you know, I've always been asked by many, many people is why is this happening? And why do we know so little about the brain and behavior signatures of autism in females? And this is sort of nicely illustrated in this figure. So autism research studies have been dominated in the last 60 or 80 years by male participants. The underrepresentation of non-male participants in research studies is because of small sizes, small sample sizes, potentially because autistic females as represented in the female figure here are being underrecognized or not diagnosed at all. So if you have these small sample sizes of non-male participants, it makes it very difficult to find the effects of sex. And thus researchers may limit their analysis to only include male participants. So if you look back if in the last 80 years of research, 95% of the research studies are male only research studies and only around 2% have male and female, which is not good at all. In addition, Clinically diagnosed autistic females have a lot of uh, psychopathology uh, compared to males. And as researchers like me, we often screen participants and exclude them so that we have a cleaner sample. We are more likely to exclude females uh, from our research studies. As a result, male to female participant ratio in research studies is actually even more exaggerated than the actual general population. So, Indeed, that's really the case. A number of meta-analysis have shown that where the actual population ratio is four to one, in the actual brain studies or neurological studies, the ratio is almost 15 to one. That means you have one female for every 15 participants which are enrolled in a research study related to autism, which is not good at all. So these discrepancies sort of leave autistic females significantly underrepresented in research and almost poorly understood in clinical practice, which sort of further drives the male bias or male knowledge bias. And consequently, almost little is known about the behavior and brain signatures of autism in girls. Um, so we were presented this problem like really long time back. And the question was like, how do we actually address this problem? And what is the solution so that we could improve our understanding of autism in girls? And so we proposed this idea of leveraging this large scale science approach where the idea is you capitalize on large amounts of publicly available data, 
which is collected across multiple studies shared by multiple investigators um, to open source um, databases. And as you could imagine, this has several advantages of this pair approach. The first and foremost is you get very large sample sizes that have enough power, which was not present before, to detect robust and replicable findings uh, in females. The decentralized nature of the data collection also allows better capture of the population variance than if you were to collect in a centralized one, which is typically the case where people um, like us, when I started doing the research, we used to go in Palo Alto, Stanford, collect you know, 25 or 50 uh, individuals with autism. And as you can imagine, um, the data which we collect in Palo Alto is going to be much different than the data maybe in Minnesota or New York City or Seattle or in the UK or maybe in China. So the idea there is if you have these large scale science approach, you're aggregating data from different sites, from Palo Alto, New York, uh, not just in the US, across the US, outside the US. And this allows us to capture the real population variance, which is inherent in the autism sample. The other sort of advantage of this kind of approach is it's leveraging what is already existing. So we are not collecting any new data, hence it's highly cost effective and really quite you know, um, fast. We don't have to wait for a really long period of time. And last but not the least, this large scale science approach has been really grown to be very, very successful in many other biomedical fields, notably in oncology, where it has sort of revolutionized um, in the 1990s and 2000s uh, the pace of research uh, which happened uh, in that particular domain. So the overall sort of goals of a research program was to address these three research questions. First, we need to understand what are the behavior and symptom presentations of autism in females and how does it differ from males? What is the structural organization of autistic brains in females and how does it differ? And what is the functional organization in females and how does it differ from males? And here we use large scale science approach, uh, aggregating large scale publicly available data, which allows us uh, to answer and produce reproducible findings and robust findings. So the first sort of question we examine uh, when we uh, begin this uh, work of research was what are the behavior and symptom presentations of autism in females and how do they differ from those in females? To do that, we examine autism symptoms from over 40, 430 children uh, reported by their parents. And this data was acquired from the National Database of Autism Research, which is a huge repository, if you're not aware, um, funded by the National Institutes of Health, uh, which includes lots of data, uh, which shares clinical imaging and genomic data. And we were actually the first team um, in probably in the US and across the world to use the data set when the data set was first published by the NIH. So at that time, uh, this sample constituted one of the largest samples of um, children with autism ever examined, which included girls and boys um, with a significant numbers of females as well. So what we did was we examined the clinical data, which is essentially um, we used autism diagnostic interview uh, data and compare them between girls and boys. And what we found was girls with ASD compared to ASD boys exhibited less severe restricted and repetitive behaviors, where there was you know, no difference in communication and social deficits, which are the other two sort of uh, domains affected in autism. And this was, you know, a great finding was statistically highly significant because we had the power, because we had a large sample size. The large scale science approach also allows us to like examine replicability of our findings because there are multiple data sets. We could keep one data set as a discovery or replication sample and then check our main finding in the replication finding, replication cohort. And that is what we did. So essentially we, exa we, ex we did exactly the same analysis in a new data set, uh, again, publicly available. And we observed the same sort of finding where 
we found that girls with ASD compared to ASD boys exhibited less uh, severe RRB where there was no differences in communication and social deficits. Again, demonstrating uh, the robustness of our findings. So what is sort of the, you know, um, the female autism phenotype that sort of emerged from our findings suggests a pattern of less severe RRB and male level social communication difficulties during childhood in females with ASD. Um, so we published this research in, you know, around in 2015. And since then, a lot of multiple studies have sort of observed the same finding using large scale samples, even larger uh, than what we initially used. So the most recent study was published maybe a couple of months back, and it used almost 9,000 individuals with ASD. And they used the ADIR, which we used as well in our study, and it also used ADOS, uh, which is again a commonly used diagnostic instrument. And they found a similar pattern, which is less severe RRB in females with autism compared to males and male level social communication deficits. Again, and now if you think about it, these two findings are one of the most consistent findings in females with autism. More recent sort of studies have also sort of suggested that the girls with ASD actually sort of more improve over time across childhood. Another aspect of autism phenotype, which is sort of often neglected, but almost anyone who knows an individual with autism knows about it, is that individuals diagnosed with autism frequently experience one or more comorbid conditions. It could be ADHD, epilepsy, schizophrenia, anxiety, a lot of conditions. And these co-occurring problems affect the overall prognosis and the degree of long-term adaptation of individuals on the spectrum. And therefore it is very, very important to study them. So what we did was in a subsequent study, we actually examined the potential effects of sex or gender on comorbidity in autism. And to, to do that, we examined clinical data um, from, again, a Stanford electronic databases, which include all the children and adult cases treated at Stanford from 1995 to present, and this included 4,790 individuals with autism and over a million non-ASD participants, constituting one of the largest medical data sets of ASD. And so we compare almost 20 co-occurring, commonly co-occurring conditions with um, ASD between males and females in the ASD population and these analyses reveal statistically significant sex differences in two comorbid conditions. First is aged ADHD was less prevalent in females with ASD compared to males with ASD and epilepsy, which was more prevalent in females with ASD compared to males with ASD. Notably, we also compared uh, these discrepancies in non-ASD population. And what we found was this discrepancy was more in the ASD population suggesting a specificity of this particular uh, comorbidity finding. So this addition of a particular comorbid condition, which again suggests adds to the female autism phenotype. And so this is, these were, um, most of these studies uh, were conducted, including us, were conducted in childhood. And one of the things which is sort of emerging um, from recent, very, very recent studies in 2021 and 2022, including some of our own published, unpublished work, suggest that the female autism phenotype is nuanced and is actually influenced by age and gendered socio-ecological context. For instance, um, there is some evidence from our work, recent work, based on parent report, that although girls improve with time across childhood, they have more severe problems during adolescence, suggesting a huge influence of age. And we have also seen similar effect of the gender socio-ecological context. So what these set of studies sort of suggest that provide a robust sort of evidence of 
RRB symptoms and ADHD epilepsy comorbid patterns in girls with ASD are significantly different from that in boys with autism. Importantly, it's important to note the sex differences in the observed behavior and symptom presentation of autism is influenced by age and socio-ecological context. So the next set of questions we asked was what is the structural organization of autistic brains in females and how does it differ from that in males? Again, to answer this particular question, we use um, a large scale science approach, which we use to examine the behavior and symptomatic presentation of ASD in females. In this case, we use clinical and structural MRI data. So structural MRI data allows us to examine uh, different aspects of brain morphometry or brain structure, including um, brain gray matter volume, white matter volume, uh, gray matter density, so on and so forth. And for this purposes, we leverage um, the Autism Brain Imaging Data Exchange, which is a research data repository, um, which is a sort of, again, funded by the NIH, but managed uh, by the research community um, based in New York City of previously collected uh, structural MRI data, as well as functional MRI data from almost 530 individuals with autism and 550 typical controls. And the most notable aspect of this particular data set, which is a bit different from the NIH data set, which is US-based, it included data from 16 different sites. Uh, so it includes data from Germany, China, the UK, uh, the Netherlands, Belgium, and which allowed us to sort of understand or capture the heterogeneity of this population across a broad ge geographical spectrum. So we, we had this clinical data and uh, the MRI data. And so to identify, we use sort of a unique approach. To, our goal was to identify differences in the structural brain organization between girls and boys. So what we used was something called multivariate pattern analysis. Uh, just to unfold that, Whereas conventional univariate analysis, uh, which is typically used in research, reveal which brain regions differ on a relevant brain dimension, could be gray matter, white matter, anything, between participant groups, in this case, males and females, multivariate analysis capture brain patterns that discriminate two participant groups. Importantly, MVPA techniques, or which is referred to as multivariate pattern analysis, provide greater sensitivity than univariate approaches for detecting subtle group differences, as is typically the case <clears throat> with brain differences between males and females with ASD. <clears throat> so what we did was we took the structural MRI, applied um, this multivariate brain matter, and asked the question, is this male or female? And then uh, look at the brain regions which are different uh, between the two populations. <clears throat> so what we found using this um, multivariate pattern analysis was the gray matter in several cortical and subcortical regions could differentiate girls and boys with ASD. And what we found out these regions or these brain regions included the precentral gyrus, which is shown up on the top left, the cerebellum, uh, the <clears throat> SMA, the which are the key nodes of the motor system, as well as the fusiform gyrus, the amygdala, as well as the insular regions that are very key nodes of the social brain. <clears throat> so to assess whether these brain regions that showed sex differences in brain morphometry in autism were also different in the neurotypical peers, we specifically we asked the question, whether the regions that could reliably distinguish girls with ASD from boys with ASD could also distinguish between neurotypical girls from neurotypical boys. We found that none of the regions examined could accurately differentiate neurotypical girls from neurotypical boys, suggesting that there are gender differences, gender or sex differences in the structural brain organization in autism that differ 
from uh, normative gender or sex differences. So what we found so far is pattern of gray matter differences in fem females versus males with ASD, which were different than normal of males and females with ASD. In our previous sort of studies, as I mentioned, we observed differences in behavior, which was different in RRB. So the next question was, hey, we have differences at the brain level. We also have differences at the behavioral level. Does the brain differences explain what we observe in the behavior level? So to do this analysis, what we did was we examined the regions which were different in males and females with ASD and then correlated with their clinical scores in the restricted and repetitive behavior, the social and communication difficulties. And what we found that the gray matter volume in the motor cortex, the SMA, and the cerebellum, which showed sex differences, were correlated with scores on the repetitive and restricted domain of the autism diagnostic interview in girls with ASD, but not to other social and communication difficulties, providing sort of a domain specific behavioral relevance of the observed sex differences. So what we observe there is we have differences at the brain level. We have differences in the behavioral level um, between females with ASD and males with ASD. And there is a tight link between the observed differences at the brain level and the observed differences at the female level, which sort of completes the loop of saying that we are not these differences which we observe at the behavioral level are driven by the differences at the brain level. So to summarize this sort of uh, part of our talk, our results sort of suggest that the structural brain organization in girls with ASD is significantly different from that in boys with ASD, especially in brain regions belonging to the motor system and systems that form part of the social brain. Critically, if you think about why motor system and social brain the restricted and repetitive behavior has a lot of motoric components. Like, you know, you have observations like repetitive hand movement, rocking back and forth or sideways, so on and so forth. Right? And of course, we find differences in the social brain region, which underlie the social deficits, right? The social brain regions involve the insula, the amygdala, which have been shown even in the typical population very, very important um, to sort of implement these social functions. What we importantly also, you know, sort of found was the sex differences in the structural brain organization in autism differ from normative sex differences. This is very important because there's a plenty of studies which have found that there are substantial differences in the brain structure between typical males and females. And identifying that the differences in the autistic brains were different than the typical brain suggests that being autistic sort of changes those differences which you observe between males and females. And these were not just differences at the brain level. These were functionally very, very relevant because what we found was the sex differences at the brain level were associated with the clinical phenotype, essentially the RRB, um, where the motoric part of the brain were related uh, to the motoric component of one of the core deficits of autism. Again, pointing out to the functional significance of our findings. The next sort of critical question um, we you address very recently um, was what is the functional organization of autistic brains in females and how does it differ uh, from that in males? Again, to answer this particular question, we used the large scale science approach specifically 
Here we compile one of the largest sets of clinical and functional fMRI data collected from girls and boys with autism to date, which sort of allowed, which had sufficient power uh, to uh, you know, find robust um, differences in males and females in uh, their functional architecture. Specifically, our primary data set consisted of almost 126 females, girls with autism, and 552 boys with autism. And this data was acquired from um, the Abide cohort, uh, which I mentioned previously, and also included a lot of data which have we have been collecting over a period of the last 15 years uh, here at Stanford University. Again, the large-scale science approach allows us to examine the robustness of our findings. So we also sort of collated a replication data set uh, from our colleagues and collaborators at uh, in New York City um, from the Child Mind Institute, where they've been collecting data from individuals with autism as well as typical and individuals with other disorders. And this constituted our replication cohort. So from these set of subjects, we had the clinical data, which is, you know, the diagnostic assessments, IQ, so on and so forth. Um, we also have functional MRI data. So the functional MRI data, um, just as a brief primer, the individual is, um, or here in this case, a child with autism. Uh, we bring the individual to the scanner. Uh, we put him in the scanner and we ask that particular individual uh, to keep their eyes closed in the scanner over a period of five to six minutes. And then we collect scans of the brain. What this data collects is understanding of how different parts of the brain are interacting with each other over a period of four to six minutes. Okay. And the interaction with the brain regions sort of reflects the information processing or how different regions of the brain interact with each other, right? So essentially, if you think um, from, if you look at a map of the US, um, if you look at, take a snapshot of it, then you think that the highways are, are sort of the, the cities are the brain regions and the highways are things which connect cities. If you take a brain MRI, it would get that information. But if you take a functional MRI, it would also visualize how cars travel between different cities. So this would allow us to sort of understand how information flows from one city to other. So in fMRI, if you scan a participant, it's allowing to extract information of how one brain region communicates with other brain region. And so to answer this question about what are the brain organization or functional differ between females and males with ASD. So essentially we ask this question, are there brain regions in females with ASD which communicate differently with other brain regions relative to males with ASD? So we want to see how two different brain regions interact with each other in females and how they interact with males. And we want to see, are those differences different in males compared to females? And so it's nicely illustrated in this flow chart. So essentially we collect data from individuals with autism and males and females. This is fMRI data. Uh, we, we look at different brain regions and then we give it to, as an input to thing which we refer to as deep neural networks. Uh, so deep neural networks are, are kind of, if you think of it very simplistically, allows us to examine particular patterns which differentiate between two different groups. For example, if you have a photo of a cat or a dog, if you give it to a deep neural network, it, it would try to identify what are the features which could differentiate a cat versus a dog. In this case, there it would be a picture of a cat and a dog taken by a camera. In this case, what we are trying to answer is to take a picture. In this case, the camera is your brain scanner. The image is actually our functional MRI. 
and we are on, so instead of cat or dog, here the question is, how do these brain patterns differentiate between males and females with ASD? And then what we do is, once we understand, can we differentiate males and females? And if we can, just like cat and dog, we could say that, hey, the brain of a female with ASD is different compared to a male with ASD. And the next question we ask is, what part of the brain is different between males and females? And we apply the same procedure where people have developed to understand, hey, we identify what is the difference between a cat and a dog? What aspect of cat and dog is different? Are the facial features different? Are the eyes different? Are the neck different? And that we use a similar approach to understand the brain differences at the brain between females and males. And it's, it's important to highlight here is we use this particular approach is because conventional approaches, even more sophisticated approaches using you know, simple statistical methods, which have been there for almost 50 years, just could not identify that the males and female differences between um, these um, in these particular cohorts. So using of more sophisticated technologies, which have sort of revolutionized uh, other parts of um, our life um, can be used to identify differences between males and females. So the first thing we observed was we first trained sort of these deep neural network model on the data which we acquired as well as the multi-site a byte cohort. Again, uh, to note here, the data included um, participants from over 21 different countries across the world. Again, substantially representing uh, the autism population across the world, as well as the heterogeneity, and also represents different scanners, uh, different acquisition protocols, different clinicians, different language, so on and so forth. In spite of all these differences, our deep learning neural network model achieved consistently high classification accuracy, which almost 86% in distinguishing between females and males with autism. What they suggest that the brains of males and females with autism are different. Then we ask this question, what aspect of the brains are different or which are the brain regions which communicate differentially with other parts of the brain in females compared to males. And what we observe that brain features associated with motor system and language systems that are known to be impaired in autism per se, as well as brain in systems involved in visual spatial attention systems, which is key, which have not been reported previously in the autism literature, reliably distinguish between females and males with ASD. And so these brain regions are shown in red over these brain plots. Okay? And this was a major finding, again, looking at data over thousands of individuals. The next question to ask is, hey, is this robust, right? Which again, to do that, we look at exactly the train system, right? We next applied our train model uh, to the data which we acquired uh, from New York City. And it should be noted that the data which we acquired from New York City, the healthy brain network was not used for training. So that, that means the model had never seen the individuals with autism from New York City at all. So it constitutes a fully independent data set for demonstrating the generalizability of uh, the findings. This is a very, very crucial step in which most approaches are widely known to fail. And what we observed that we identify similar patterns and we absolutely replicated all our finding in uh, the replication cohort with the main finding, which is the brains can be differentiated with high classification accuracy and the regions also overlap quite a lot. And the next question we asked was, is this specific to autism? Are we finding differences, just gender differences, or this is specific to autism? So what we did was we assessed whether the brain areas that showed sex differences in the functional brain organization, which were the motor regions, the language region, the visual spatial regions, were also different in the neuroreplical peers. So what we found that our model, which were trained to distinguish between girls and boys with ASD, trained in the Stanford cohort, which were able to distinguish between males and females with ASD from the New York City cohort, however, could not distinguish 
between your typical girls and boys, which, which we collected at Stanford as well as the New York City, suggesting that there are gender differences in the functional brain organization in autism that differ from normative gender differences. Okay. Again, as we did in the structural um, study, we wanted to see does the regions which we found that there are differences, but what is the functional consequences of these brain level differences? Are they related to behavior, which is again different? <clears throat> so what we did was we took all the brain regions which were different between males and females with ASD and then correlated to the clinical scores, which we again obtained uh, from all the individuals which we examined. And what we found out was the motor networks, primary motor cortex, predicted the severity of restricted repetitive behavior, which is again a very motoric aspect of, um, the, but of the disorder, which we again have previously shown to be different between males and females with ASD. Again, this particular, the brain patterns in the motor cortex were not at all related to the social as well as communication scores collected from the ADIR, indicating domain-specific effects associated with RRBs, which again is a core clinical symptom of ASD, which has been, as I mentioned previously, consistently reported to differ between genders. Surprisingly, this relationship were only observed in girls, but not in boys with ASD, indicating some levels of female protective effect in these particular brain regions, which sort of lowers um, their um, repetitive behavior scores compared to females, males with ASD. So what we found from this particular analysis was the functional brain organization in girls with ASD is significantly different from that in boys with ASD, especially in brain regions belonging to the motor system, the language system, and the visuospatial systems. Again, here, the sex differences in functional brain organization in autism differ significantly from normative sex differences in functional brain organization, which is the key. Remarkably, what we observed was this, for me, this was an amazing finding because the functional brain organization deficits, what would we find or differences in the functional brain organization overlap with sex differences in the structural brain organization, sort of providing converging evidence of brain level differences in um, our, our sex brain level, or brain level sex differences in ASD. Again, similar to structural brain organization, the regions whose structural deficits map on to the clinical deficits in uh, females were similar in the functional aspect as well, where the functional deficits in the motor cortex were also associated with restrictive and repetitive behavior uh, in females with ASD. Again, providing overlap with the structural findings. Again, the notable aspect of this here was the brain characteristic of sex differences in ASD overlap only partly with overall brain aberrancies in ASD, emphasizing convergent and distinct underlying mechanism of sex differences in the disorder. What this suggests is there are certain patterns. So for example, if, you're, if you have autism, there is a set of brain systems which are abnormal, the same brain systems are different between males and females. But in addition to that, there are some other brain systems which are not sort of affected in ASD, but they also show brain differences. And what is the functional relevance of that? That's a very important question. How does it affect other aspects of functional adaptation, which are different in females? That's you know, a question for future research. So in terms of these particular studies, which we conducted over a period of last six or seven years, it provides a, a somewhat clear picture of the behavior and the brain differences or signatures of autism in females. 
First and foremost, we observe or provide robust evidence for distinct behavior and symptom presentation profiles in girls with ASD compared to boys with ASD. So our evidence sort of supports the need for sex specific scoring of diagnostic instruments such as the ADIR and the ADOS. It also sort of suggests to revising the content of these instruments so that it's more sensitive to capture the female autism phenotype, which may not be captured using the current content of these diagnostic instruments. So that's the behavioral aspect of our finding. In the brain, what we observe that both the structural and the functional brain organization in girls and boys with ASD differs, and it does not just differ quantitatively in the same brain regions which are affected in ASD, but it also differs qualitatively, and that these differences contribute to the distinct behavior and symptom presentation profile, sort of again reflecting the functional significance of these findings. Again, what is the implication of this finding? It allows sort of the provide no novel and robust neural candidates. For instance, the motor cortex or the motor system, which we observed to be different in the males and females with ASD, could be targeted. For example, using different like pharmacological uh, interventions, maybe to TMS, to develop new treatment or to modify sex specific treatment um, in the future. So the next question, which sort of is immediate is what's next? So what are the priorities for future research? And as I tell everyone, this is just a tip of iceberg and a lot needs to be done for us to better understand uh, females with autism. For instance, most autism research, including ours, do not make a clear distinction between sex and gender nor do they address them separately, which is not good. So delineating the direct and interactive effects of sex and gender on behavior and symptom presentation, as well as neurobiology in autism is therefore critical and should be a priority for future research. Second, most ASD research, including ours, are either cross-sectional that means they look at, you know, compare between children and adults or focused on certain age group, which is typically in the autism case, where most, almost 90% of research is focused on children with autism and only examining high functional individuals, right? So we, uh, we have an IQ cutoff in almost all of our studies. The main reason for that, it's very difficult to scan individuals on the lower end of the spectrum. So essentially, most of these studies are excluding those on the lower end of the spectrum. So to get a better a comprehensive understanding of the female autism, it is critical to clarify the role of sex and gender on the neurodevelopmental trajectory of the behavior as well as the symptom presentation and the neurobiology of autism through large scale longitudinal investigation that span the entire lifespan, right from toddler to all the way to adulthood and cover the entire spectrum from lower IQ to higher IQ. Last but not the least, future work should also prioritize developing new and refining existing diagnostic instruments, as I mentioned before, and treatments for autism. And importantly, they should be informed by neuroscientific knowledge through sex and gender perspective. This is important so that the management and the care models of individuals with autism are more inclusive than what they are right now and more precise and effective in the future. So I would like to thank uh, my colleagues and collaborators on these uh, set of studies, um, open science initiatives who provided data without them, uh, most of our research would not have been possible, as well as a lot of funding agencies here at Stanford, the NIH, 
and private foundations for their significant contributions to our study. And really want to thank you uh, very much uh, for your time and attention. And I'll be more than happy to answer absolutely any questions you may have in the next nine or 10 minutes we have. Thank you very much. Thanks for that great presentation. So we do have quite a few questions here. I will start at the top. Uh, this first one, this person, it's a long question, so I'll read it to you. The collection of large scale collection of data doesn't capture the population of autistic females without intellectual impairment, but it does seem to capture the ones who are diagnosed based on diagnostic criteria and instruments. So it doesn't capture the actual general population of females who are largely underdiagnosed. Females are referred less frequently and misdiagnosed. Mm -hmm. So it's, I think this person is just observing that we have to change the criteria and instruments, which you addressed. She then asked, um, I may have missed the age of the people examined and the effects of hormones on development in adolescence is essential. So did you, I, I don't know that you touched on that specifically. Did you address that in the study? In terms of hormones and... Um... Age, yeah. I know you talked about age a little bit. Did Was hormones part of the discussion when you were doing yeah, it? I think I think those are great questions. I think it becomes, a, so I would answer a two-part question. One is we are sort of, it's a chicken and egg problem because um, we are including females who actually receive a diagnosis to understand the problem of what of individuals who are not um, diagnosed using the current set of instruments. And so I think we need to be more inclusive, maybe using an RDoc kind of an approach where the idea is to not use specific cutoff on a particular domain, but use look at autism as a continuum uh, where the labels are not that critical and then see gender differences on the continuum rather than a sort of categorical approach, which is quite common uh, in our research. So that might sort of address the question of what of those females who are who don't receive official diagnosis of autism. And in terms of hormones, I think that's a great question. Again, we don't have we haven't looked at it specifically in our studies. Um, because for a lot of these data was not available. Uh, we did look at uh, age. Uh, so in all our studies, age is sort of looked at as a confounding factor and we remove the effects of age. But I think it would be very interesting to look at how do these differ brain differences change as a function of age? Because we know behavioral changes with age, right? Uh, so the brain also sort of has to change with it. And then does the effect does the change in brain also influences what is happening at the behavioral level. I think those are great possibilities for future research. All right. This is a totally different question. They're mm -hmm. asking how far are we from having diagnose, diagnostic tools that are gender specific? Yeah, I think um, if you had asked me this question maybe like five or 10 years back, I would have said we are very far away. I think with all these large scale initiatives, and as one of the things which I mentioned, you know, um, the recent study where people have looked at almost 10,000 individuals with autism, this was almost impossible like five years back. So the more data we have, um, the more evidence we're gonna get. And once we have evidence, then we could actually implement it in pilot settings and then see what's actually happening, right? Because it has to be taken one step at a time. And it has to be enforced or informed by robust neuroscientific evidence. And I think we are moving towards it. I can't give an exact timeline, but I think it shouldn't take a long, long time. But I think people are thinking about it. I think that's a very, very important thing. All right. I don't know. I'm reading this question. We'll see if it's something you can answer. Um, have you done a differentiation of the brain for people with autism and other co-occurring conditions like ADD, visual and memory, OCD, ODD, et cetera. A lot of parents grapple with that, having uh, multiple co-occurring conditions. Yeah, um, we haven't looked at all of them. Um, so we have looked at things which are the most highly co-occurring, which is ADSD and schizophrenia. Um, and we do find differences using, again, this is unpublished work currently under review, where we do find differences with uh, where, so essentially what we did was 
we looked at individuals with ASD who don't have ADHD, and we look at individuals with ASD who have ADHD, and we look at are there brain differences, and we do find differences uh, in those individuals. Um, so, so the immediate question which comes to mind is, is ASD plus ADHD very different than ADHD as well? And that's sort of the question all of us grapple with. Um, and maybe the brain findings we have um, could inform that. And we have done for schizophrenia, and there is some work where we've looked at autism as well, uh, anxiety as well, uh, where the question there is, because we know a lot about anxiety in typical population, in the sense like typical population having anxiety, and what we ask the question is, are the brain differences in individuals with autism uh, who have anxiety differ from what we know of typical individuals with anxiety? Great question again. Yeah, and there's a question about PANS, PANDAS. I know you have a colleague at Stanford who's done some research on that. Are, are you aware of any crossover studies occurring with gender related to, to that co-occurring condition? No, as far as I know, to my knowledge, I haven't, I don't know about Nothing that. gender specific. Yeah, okay. nothing gender specific. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's another question here just asking about schizophrenia. So anything about about comorbidity or, or co-occurring schizophrenia with um, a gender overlay? Yeah, so what we actually find um, is the prevalence of schizophrenia in females, if I... If I remember it correctly, was different in females compared to males. And the differences start to appear later in adolescence. Uh, so we don't find, like later in adulthood, sorry, uh, we don't find those differences in the prevalence, uh, at least in the Stanford data set, which we looked at, which had almost 5,000 individuals with autism, where the prevalence is different, similar to how we find ADHD uh, differences in males and females in children. We find the same thing in schizophrenia, uh, but in adulthood, not in childhood or adolescence at all. Okay. And uh, I was reminded uh, by a couple of individuals to use the word co-occurring rather than comorbid. And I know, yeah. you know did you use that on your slides? It slipped out for me. I, I know it's, no it's been used historically, but uh, that, that we're all trying to... Uh, switch over to, to that preferred word. So um, there were questions, I, I don't know if you can answer this question because of uh, disclosure. Are there any researchers at Stanford who are on the spectrum who are part of, of this work that you're aware of? Or who have, I know that's a, a disclosure issue, so people may not. Um, no, I think it's a great question, I'm happy to answer them. We don't have anyone specifically in our research team and would love to have them actually. It really, really helps. Um, so as part of my own research, I'm a neuroscientist by training, but I make sure that I interact with as many individuals, males and females, uh, with autism while we do their scanning, while we conduct their, which I don't have to, but I still do, uh, to get not just with um, the patient per se, but also their families, to get a better picture, because I think that gives you a a better, a more comprehensive understanding of the phenotype and which sort of informs some of the research we do. So it's not direct, but indirectly we do have, I uh, do, our entire team sort of is tightly integrated with the community. All right, this is a, yeah, thanks for, thanks for tackling that one. Um, this is a question about, this is a candid comment, but it, it ends really nicely. She says, I have to admit, I was a bit suspicious of a male speaking about autism in females, but I learned a lot and I appreciate your hard work in this field. What's your advice for someone wanting to support this research and for getting more women involved? Uh, thank you very much. I think, thank you. I think we need more and more people uh, to work in this domain. Unfortunately, there are not too many people uh, who are focused on females. Um, you know, five years back, there were fewer, uh, but there is, you know, uh, there is hope that more and more people are interested. I think um, being an advocate of females, that goes a long way at every level um, to, to researchers, advocating at institutional level, advocating at the private foundational level, advocating at government level, it actually helps. And then, you know, advocating people to participate in research. So I think all kinds of advocacy goes a long way uh, to helping the research we do.
Okay. Well, we have time for one more question. I think this is a good one to end on. Do you have any recommendations or suggestions for clinicians who are treating females who are suspected may have autism, but don't meet criteria using our current assessment measures and are having difficulty getting a formal diagnosis to get support? Well, that's, I'm not a clinician, so I um, so can't sort of give a clinical answer to that. Um, I think that's a great question. I think, you know, that's, I think the way how our entire clinical and medical system and the support system of these individuals is set up, it's completely based on, do you have a diagnosis versus not? Mm -hmm. And that's sort of it's probably not the best way of handling it. And so if you don't have diagnosis, you don't get support services from your school, you don't get uh, treatment from parents, you don't get insurance, and you know you have this uh, entire system which is connected to this diagnosis thing. And if you don't have a diagnosis, I, I think I'm not sure how to, my, you know, the idealistic me would say like, let's change the entire system so that people who you think clinically need help would get help. Because that's what we want. Um, and that's what we should advocate for, that let's change it so that, you know, we know that this need person needs help and we should get help. Maybe talking to insurance people, talking to like whoever provides can provide support because end of the day, we want to improve outcomes. And that only happens through support and, you know, and advocating that let's change the system in some way, shape or form because the current system is not uh, taking care of the system who need help. And that would be